Hello, and welcome to this week's book club gathering for Yoga for the Creative Soul. So we're continuing to work our way through chapter one. Chapter one, incidentally, is actually from a higher point of view, giving us some things to contemplate regarding what the Yoga Sutras teach us are our primary, is our primary obstacle to peace of mind. Um, the Yoga Sutras talk about these obstacles that we experience and that it is very normal for all of us with our thinking minds and our spiritual journeys to get in our own way. So the primary blockage that we'll talk about a little bit today is forgetting our spiritual selves or the Sanskrit word for that is avidya. A, if you know your Sanskrit, is the prefix that means not, and then vidya, unified, awake, uh, in divine knowledge. These kleshas are pointed out early in the second chapter of the Yoga Sutras, the chapter two of the Yoga Sutras being the portion on practice, where you could think of this as your handbook to enlightenment, is like, do these things gain uh, unity with who you truly are. And they start there at Sutra 12 and carry forth over the next five or so sutras. Uh, chapter 2, Sutra 12 as your, as your starting point, introducing the kleshas, as they are known in Sanskrit, the obstacles or the hindrances to living as our true selves. And part, each chapter in part one of Yoga for the Creative Soul is going into each of those hindrances or obstacles. And then I, I try to frame that in the context of our creative lives, our expressive journeys, our mental health. So where we are right now in our book club gatherings is uh, part two of a three-part series in creating the future self. Last week, we talked about how we feel like we need to change something, like the idea of setting a resolution. And we then think of change as either I'm doing it or I'm not doing it. And the reality of change is actually that it is a process that starts with us not even thinking that we need to change at all and moves through the phases of contemplation, like do I need to change this? Preparation, how am I gonna change this? Um, action. Here's me taking the step to change it. Maintenance, where like, can I maintain this change? Is this weaving itself into my lifestyle in a meaningful way? Um, and from maintenance, we go one of two ways. We either relapse, and remember that relapse is a part of recovery. We'll talk about that today as well. Either relapse or stable behavior. It's just what I do. I never used to floss my teeth, and then I had to floss at least one tooth every day. And if you're gonna floss one tooth, you might as well floss the entire quadrant. And if you're gonna floss the quadrant, you might as well floss the entire row. And gradually it turns into stable behavior, which, you know, in that flossing example, um, we'll, we'll work with that throughout our day because there are some questions that have arisen from the group today as well about, living into this process of change in a meaningful fashion. And indeed, chapter two of the Yoga Sutras give us some guidance and recommendations on that also. Oh, so as we center into looking at what is standing in our way, what is the kalesha that's interfering with our intention, let's just give ourselves some meaningful breaths and those of you participating in the three-part series, think back to next week. Think of the, the change that you wish to bring into your life right now. Consider your intention and as you breathe, feel your breath being charged, activated by that intention. So your state of mind is harmonizing with your breath and body. Around this vision or intention,
breathing the intention, feeling it elaborate through the state of mind, feeling it flow on the breath, through your cells, activating the mind-body process, activating, vitalizing this change within you. And if there's any places that feel a little stagnant, a little held, a little stressed, give yourself some movements to release that from your body. Just a, li a little bit of upward or sideward reaching, perhaps side bending, or rolling through the joints of the body, aching up, moving. Continuing to carry your intention with you through the movements. Notice the kinds of thoughts and feelings that might be occurring that might be imposing limitations upon you. And these can be actual negative thoughts, but they might also be anxieties or busyness or overwhelm, it might be doubt might be just uncertainty in the intention itself, and that's okay. Whenever we endeavor to change anything, we learn more about the obstacles. Unexpected behaviors, beliefs, habits will get in the way. If you can keep your deep breathing going during this educational component today, you're welcome to doodle or um, if not doodle, maybe draw, maybe flip through images, collage, even move throughout the course of the instruction. So you're allowing expression to come through you. And, and this is today and every meeting, allowing expression to come through you even as uh, even as we're in discussion phases of our time together. What we know is that deeply held beliefs often run our habits, which means that deeply held beliefs can be holding the reins of our addictive behaviors, of the ways that we harm ourselves, but can also steer us and encourage us in the ways that we want to move forward in our lives. Deeply held beliefs don't necessarily mean negative core beliefs. They could also be happy, healthy programming that runs. Not all programming is um, harmful, right? Not all programming is an obstacle. In fact, digging into that chapter two of the yoga sutras, it's teaching us a lot about programming, deprogramming and counter programming. Yoga itself is an educational philosophy, is a science or a grammar of spiritual living, of state of mind training. And so further to that point, the first thing that they're teaching us there in those sutras is to limit the harm that we're causing, limit the harmful behaviors, limit the harmful thoughts and feelings. And when we attempt to do that, naturally, the underlying beliefs begin to reveal themselves as well. As yoga is a process of peeling the layers of understanding what's going on there beneath the surface. What are the deeper mechanisms at play here? And it's nice, we're lucky that we have this guide to carry us through. In, in a little extrapolation, that's what part one of Yoga for the Creative Soul is also doing. It's just giving you, um, giving you ways to work with those concepts from the Yoga Sutras. So we know that when we try to change a behavior, the obstacles and underlying beliefs reveal themselves. Thinking of your intention, from last week, or if, if this is a, a one-off for you, just thinking of an intentional change you're making in your life right now, 
write down or draw uh, an affirmation that goes along with that. Some statement of prayerfulness, of belief, or of support that you can come back to or that can hold you, anchor you in place as you're making this change. Remember that affirmations are meant to be a statement of the positive, that is to say what you, what you want, not what's in your way. Uh, stated in the present tense, they are more effective, studies have found, if there's an adjective there. So, and if we use all the pronouns when we state our affirmation. So um, going back to flossing, my affirmation might be, I enjoy, I'm thinking of an adjective. I enjoy shiny dental health. He enjoys shiny dental health. You enjoy shiny dental health. They enjoy shiny dental health. We enjoy shiny dental health. She enjoys shiny dental health. Erin enjoys shiny dental health. And that's how, that's how an affirmation around flossing might look. So give yourself a moment if you haven't done it already and create an anchor and affirming statement for you, my actual affirmation about flossing is about my heart, my anatomical heart, because there's some research there that has linked those quite closely. And in the real age test, you get two extra years if you floss your teeth. So there you go. Um, right, and if you didn't quite come up with that affirmation yet, that's okay. Keep the question in mind as we proceed today. Um, something came up linking last week to this week in the book club in terms of when we make a change, we sometimes name the great big thing. And it's really important to remember change itself is challenging enough. We need to be asking ourselves as we're going through this process of change, am I taking too big a bite? Am I asking myself to change something when really this is 15 other changes that need to happen in order for this change to come about. Um, it's useful for us to understand the component steps involved in making the change. So flossing the teeth is an easy one and I broke that down earlier today even to say like if Flossing your entire mouth when you're not used to it is actually a five minute process when you're already tired at the end of the day. That's gonna need a lot of adaptation. So that's how it got broken down to floss one tooth. That was over a long period of time. Um, and a lot of dentists are recommending that you floss at lunchtime. You still have the energy as long as you're flossing sometime, anytime, it counts. It doesn't have to be at the end of the day even if that's ideal because then you're you know fasting overnight. But um, Oh, creatures, welcome to our book club. And speaking of welcome to our book club, here comes Karen. So um, breaking it down into the smaller steps. And a lot of the time, you know, when we think about from maintenance, we're either going into stable behavior or relapse. Relapse is a part of recovery. Every time we slip up and stop living our intention, growth mindset, that is a learning opportunity. And it truly is a learning opportunity because there's a reason we faltered. There's a reason we missed it. What is that? So core beliefs, we could get down on ourselves. Oh, see, I am lazy. I fail at everything. I've tried to change this a hundred times and it never changes. Core belief, core belief, core belief, not useful. Or growth mindset, how did this happen? In what ways was I set up for a slip? And there are answers to those questions. Those answers do not um, relate back to simple laziness, even in laziness. And this is where one-on-one -on -one therapy can be really useful. We take that core belief about ourselves and we pick apart, okay, where did that belief system come from? How is that playing out in your everyday life? What are, what's the evidence to the contrary? What's the evidence that support that belief system? And um, what other programming is at play? It's really easy just to say lazy, but it's inaccurate and it's not useful. I, I've not worked with anybody who just landed at lazy and stayed there who actually made the change. 
but I've worked with many people who have understood, stretched laziness apart and found, oh, lazy is just a blanket for all these other things. And all these other things come from somewhere. And when we work that through, laziness is an example of any harmful limiting core belief, any obstacle. Ah, we're free. Ta-da! And the way this relates to the kleshas is that these core beliefs are living in that avidya, are living in that forgetting of the true self. But when we invoke the true self, back to your intention and back to your affirmation, when we invoke the true self, then the power of the divine, however you define it, um, that can be as simple as the innate power of your true self, or that might also be the spiritual helpers, uh, if you believe in and have those, I believe that we all have them, um, that that divine power comes through and fortifies the actions that we're taking to make the changes and improve our lives. Because you're doodling while I'm talking here, if I can be directive, maybe doodle a little bit of what that specific thing is. Doodling a little bit of moving through the obstacle, the avidya, the forgetting the divine self, and doodle in what ways is the divine coming in and helping you. Uh, before we started the recording today, uh, a person held up her, her collage uh, representing her change. And in that collage, in an important place, was water. Because the elemental power of water, the soothing music of water, the beauty of water, and the way all of those molecules come together to form a unified body uh, is so meaningful to, to us, right? And maybe somebody else would have included wind or fire or a tree, the earth. But whatever it is, aspects of the divinity are an important part of anchoring us back into who we really are, into living the intention. So um, there you be, doodling your, doodling your affirmation, yourself free from the blocks, any divine help that may be there for you. And, um, and I'll continue speaking. So breaking down the intention into bite-sized pieces often arises naturally through the process of relapse rather than stable behavior. That we often think that our intention is bite-sized enough and then we realize, wow, this is a lot. Like another one that I think of often would be a nutritional change or starting to exercise more. Well, a nutritional change, now you've got to change your grocery list, your weekly meals, your hunger satiety um, relationships, right? Because any nutritional change is going to change our blood sugars, our hormone levels, uh, energy, hunger satiety, and, you know, outside the scope of what we're talking about, but just so that we are coming to a meaningful thread is that the best evidence is bringing us back to intuitive eating, trusting the signals from the body in terms of what's going to be the most nutritious at that time, portion sizes, when am I really hungry, and then just staying hydrated throughout. But even that, <laughs> intuitive eating uh, is a huge process. I work a lot with that in my practice as well. And even the baseline connection to the body so that we can start to understand what intuitive cues are takes time. So you can see how patience is a big part of this process of change as well. And maybe it's useful for everybody to write down a quick affirmation regarding patience and the time that it takes to truly live into a change. Yes, please, and thank you. Uh, another question that came up was about prioritizing the changes. What if there are, like even within every single thing, 14 steps, but what if there's also 14 things I want to change? Well, which one is the juiciest? And that's the intuitive process. Um, somewhere in our yoga writings, it teaches us that although the journey is mighty, um, 
it's not for the faint of heart to be on this personal growth path. And it takes dedication. Although the journey is mighty, we are called to do what is simplest first. Take the path of least resistance because the journey itself is going to bring so many challenges. So, you know, people, people will say, well, I like to challenge myself with my goals. And the response I'll often give is your goal is challenging enough just to actually make it happen. So start with the easy stuff. Know what your future intentions are. Know what your vision for your life is. But go with, go with the one that is right there for you, ready to be plucked, the juiciest, ripest fruit. Um, and there in chapter two of the Yoga Sutras, this might fit into the Niyama of tapas. The niyamas, so we started today talking about the yamas, limiting harmful behaviors. The niyamas teach us to cultivate healthy behaviors, unifying behaviors. And one of those ways of doing that is uh, tapas, which is sometimes translated as discipline, which triggers people all over the place, uh, routine, um, austerity, right? Like, I believe we're in Lent right now. so the spiritual intention of giving something up for Lent is that every time we miss it, we feel the sting. Oh, I'm missing this thing. But the sting is purifying us. The sting is reminding us of gratitude. The, the, the burn of the austerity is helping us become more of the true self. Um, tapas, so that's the way it's often translated. Tapas is discipline or austerity or routine. But the literal translation is to generate light and heat. It's like sparking a fire, right? It's fire generates light and heat. Fire is also purifying that, that purity. So we're generating light and heat. That means that we are applying focus. We are giving this single change the light of our energy and the heat that is generated not only purifies us but also warms us creates a more comfortable climate for the soul and if you want to take that right back to our example of flossing we know when our health is not in line there are, there are always indications and signs that there's opportunities for us to build health. And when we notice those opportunities to build health, that lands typically in a person as a stress, back to lazy, back to not good enough, right? That kind of self-talk. But when we know we're living into the kinds of changes we want to make, we're warmed by that. We feel more heat of enthusiasm. We feel the spark within us as we're becoming more of who we want to be. Top us. So whether, it's, whether it burns us and stings us or whether it warms us, that's all part of the change. Furthermore, the fire of top us when it's approached regularly burns through the obstacles, burns off the forgetting, the negative self-talk, the avidya lights the clarity, lights the vidya. So the fire of tapas helps us remove those obstacles to change. And when we slip, when we miss it, when we relapse, that is the call to throw another log on the fire, to refine, to understand why is this burning low? What fuel do I need here? What's gonna keep me going? How did this happen? And to respond to those relapses with curiosity and kindness. So can you, can you express that somehow? Can you express two versions of yourself interacting? Version one, 
that you're depicting and you can do this in descriptive paragraph or dance or, or write a song right there's all kinds of ways to do this version one of yourself is the part that slipped what kind of you know how does that feel what negative beliefs or self-talk start to show up depict oh messed it up i relapsed and in the interact in the interaction depict the version of yourself that is the fire keeper depict the version of yourself that's holding the intention the affirmation the desire and willingness to go through the discomfort to make the change because the change is important the change is bringing you more closely aligned with who you truly are And make that interaction between those two parts of yourself really vital. Use as much sound, motion, color, interest as possible as those two parts of yourself are interacting in a, in a meaningful and supportive way. You're welcome to continue depicting that as we as we carry forth on this thought of facing the obstacles to change. So what's important is to remember to break it down into pieces. And when relapse happens in this in this circuit of change, to let that be an opportunity to warm the tapas throw another log on the fire and understand what led to the relapse so we can fortify that. As we're continuing to move through the process of change, of moving from avidya, unknowing, to vidya, pure understanding, we, um, we want to keep that manageable as well. So when we do reach stable behavior, with the thing we're attempting to change. Then we can direct that light and heat, that top us, to the next change. So it is recommended that we change one thing at a time. And in life, of course, just the nature of life and our responsibilities, we're often working on several things at the same time. And that's okay, but for your personal growth practice, as much as possible, let it be that one thing and when you've mastered it, the next thing. And when you've mastered it, the next thing. They say it takes three weeks to form a new habit. Dig into that literature a bit. You will also find that they say it takes three days. You will also find that they say it takes six months. You will also find that they say it takes two years. So there's a lot of factors at play in terms of what truly lands us in a habit come back to the patience and the curiosity remember that avidya is so important that they 
use one of those precious sutras to talk about it. There's only 195 sutras, and most of them are about states of consciousness. Very few of them are actually about here's what you do and why. Uh, that's, again, chapter two of the sutras. But the point is made that the true self, the highest expression of who you can possibly be, already exists. That part of us is already there. The issue is the obstacles. There are things standing between us and that version of ourselves. So stone by stone, branch by branch, we're getting those obstacles out of us. We are making way for the true self to shine forth even more. And yes, the true self shines forth even more through nutrition and earlier bedtimes and flossing our teeth as well as whatever creative and compelling habits you yourself are focusing on right now. Do your best to throw that light and heat behind just one thing until it feels like you've found stable behavior, and then move on. And know that um, healthy living is always a work in progress, and that's okay too. Some of the research I came up with as we were um, as we were building these three workshops was that we perceive our self once we have come to stable behavior as a different person. We perceive the future self as somebody who is not us, someone foreign. And next week, we'll dive more into this idea of creating the future self and getting to know that future version of ourselves a little more fully. For this week, I would ask that you, if possible, post your image of yourself, you know, realized self helping, relapsed self or um, yourself surrounded by the divine help, I would ask that you put that somewhere you can see it on a regular basis. It doesn't have to be somewhere everyone can see it, but somewhere that you will see it. Inside of a cupboard is always nice just to post it up in there and then you're opening that cupboard every day, but uh, it's, not, it's not out for all your family to be up in your spiritual growth business. You're always welcome to share it, but people can't always respond the way we want them to when we're sharing important stuff. So our it's another way of saying that our intention is precious. It's precious. We're mindful of how we share it. So here in um, existing book club, as it's unfolding, we'll go into breakout rooms and we'll share with our buddies that I will close out the recording now, thanking all of you who are watching it at a future time, <laughs> my future self is probably sipping water and, and maybe doing a plank pose while you're watching this, uh, this recording, but thank you for engaging with it. And do post to the group so that we all know what you're up to and can hold you um, in our prayers, energies, and intentions as well. So we're all co-creating a world together as we become more realized the thought field of realization of, of peacefulness and patience exists on the planet and that gives seekers and empaths something to harmonize with. In other words, when you are in greater contact with Vidya, the potential is that the entire world is in greater contact with Vidya. Your spiritual practice matters. If you want individual support with the path, do reach out to me for one-on-one -on -one sessions. And if you're interested a little bit more in the energies and practices of these things, I'm running a certification course the 26th to the 28th of this month. So touch base with me about that as well. I'm running it in New Hampshire. So that's, that's exciting. Uh, New Hampshire, my home away from home for sure. Thank you everybody for being here, for your engagement, and I look forward to hearing from you and seeing what you are expressing and living. <laughs>